Hi everyone. <laughs> Hi Laurie. So I'm Hi. really excited to introduce Laurie Morrison to the Emerging Proud campaign and I've just literally posted on Facebook Laurie to say I'm really excited about your interview. I was just feeling like this is really special. Um, I looked at your website again today and it just fills me with joy um, and I, I kind of get a real sense of connecting to heart when I watch your videos and uh, it's just such a beautiful thing to be connected with you so thank you so much for joining us. Oh thank you Katie that's very sweet of you to uh, stop by my little world. <laughs> So, so Laurie, you are um, you describe your sp yourself as a spirit concierge now for people who are going through the spiritual emergence process, but you're also the director of education for the Mental Health Coalition in Arizona, and I'm really, really kind of just blown away by how you manage to straddle those two worlds. Um, we we both know that's not easy. So I'd love to talk to you about how you manage that today and um, just some more about your personal story, if that's okay with you. Um, and, and I noticed on your website that you're, that you're due to publish your, um, your personal memoir as well. So um, yes. I'll... In May, in the end of May. So I have all my little, my little minions working on it right now behind <laughs> the scenes to get it ready for the world. <laughs> Wow, and it's you, your story is just well astounding, astounding. So um, yeah, uh, if you don't mind, just by starting um, with telling people a little bit of an overview about how it all happened for you, that would be great. Um, yes, yeah, so I was living in um, in El Salvador. Um, I had lived there for almost thirty years. I had been an entrepreneur in the wine and food business, um, and my husband passed away. And a year after that, um, it was my 52nd birthday, and I was hit by a beam of light on my property, which was inside of a volcanic lake <clears throat> in El Salvador. And um, from that moment, I, I realized later, um, after doing a lot of research um, through the Mayan tradition, that the 52nd birthday is when um, your, the Gregorian calendar matches the Mayan and everything comes together. And in the Mayan world, when you turn 52, um, that's your moment of change. That is a moment of, of, of shifting. Um, of course, I didn't know it at the time because I was not planning on it. <laughs> and I had, a, had not read the, the, the memo <laughs> about, <laughs> about that. Um, so um, I, um, when I, I, was, I was out of my body for three hours. And um, when I came back, I it was, I believe it, that, I believe now going back and looking at the, spirit, at the experience, I was somewhere in the fourth and fifth dimensional space of my perception. So everything I saw was sacred geometry. I saw triangles everywhere. Back to this day, I still see um, light as a triangle. I do not see a dot of light anymore. Mm. Um, my whole um, kind of perspective on the third dimension completely changed. I could see inside of people's bodies. I could see spirits. I couldn't even drive my car at the time because the spirits looked so solid to me that I thought I was running over people all the time. So it was, wow. it, it was like that full veil completely dropped and I just jumped into the fourth. Um, I sit on couches and talk to them. They seemed to, you know, to me just like normal people. <laughs> and, um, and then there was a barrage of, um, I was in a very sacred lake. There was a barrage of phenomenon and experiences. I had very typical things that I found out later were shamanic. Um, for example, it rained on just on me. Um, and, you know, things were, I had snakes all over my house. You know, like you know, I was going to go through this change. And um, mm -hmm. of course, I had no perspective, no template as to know as to know what even to do with all of this. Um, I could tell the future. I would go to board meetings, um, completely half you know half crazy, and I would go to the board meetings, and I knew exactly what was going to happen to the foundation. And I would just say like, "Why are we having these conversations?" Because I was three or four years out, you know, <laughs> seeing. <the bad point. laughs> you know, I was like, "Well, that won't be going there anymore." So it just, wow. it changed my perspective on my life. I had no real, like I say, no real way to deal with it. 
And unfortunately, it got so, um, you know, I was in so, such a disassociative place and with so much of the shamanic phenomenon going on that I couldn't, I really just couldn't get back to, I guess, what we call the third dimension. So I ended up in, in the hospitals twice. And um, when I got into the mental hospitals, I knew I was supposed to be there because I could see that a lot of the people in these mental hospitals had, um, had entities. I also saw um, just you know, bad energies around them. I saw you know, very stifling energy. And so I just started moving energy out of everybody I was going through and I was clearing people because I suddenly had this automatic download of exactly what I needed to do a yeah. shamanic practice. Yeah. And so I was just, you know, clearing everybody at the mental hospital <laughs> and doing all this work, you know. I was busy, you know. And in the meantime, forgetting that I needed to get out, out of there myself. Uh. But um, I it um, a couple times. And then finally, um, I ended up going to some outpatient um, therapy. And the, and the psychiatrist finally said to me, Lori, sometimes there's just a spiritual issue. And I had a big book of my whole case because I'd been in and out done all these different things and he said you know you're telling me and you're telling me my future <laughs> you're telling me stuff that I you know I know is happening I've checked on a lot of the stuff that you've mentioned and it's wow. true wow and he said, I think I can't help, I can't help you anymore and um that was the biggest turning point in my life when he told me he couldn't help wow he said you have a spirit you need to find a spiritual solution. So, um, Gosh, what, what an amazing so, psychiatrist. That's rare. That's so rare. He was an elderly guy. He said, he said he worked in mental hospitals back in the East Coast, the United States. He says, sometimes I would see cases like this. There was absolutely no explanation for what was going on. Um, but he said these things were real yes. that you wow. were seeing in your experience was real. So, um, I said, well, where do I, what do I do? You know, who do I call? And he said, um, call Deepak Chopra. <laughs> so I thought, well, <laughs> say Ghostbusters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, I'll call him. Um, in the meantime, I had a wonderful mentor. Um, and she was a, a she's a, a psychic medium and she had a good friend who was a, a trained shaman from Haiti. Her, her great, her great grandmother was a shaman and they passed it down to generations just you know spirit brought them into my lives and they guided me through the process through also some um people that i met um here in sedona where i live and i just started on this amazing journey to find out why i could heal people you know why i could see these things how come these you know this was now part of my life and i realized that everything that i was was no longer there was nothing left of, the, of who i was before and that the only path was to find out who I was now. And that's that big crossroads that we come to, you know, when we go through these spiritual awakenings. So, but they're painful. I mean, you want to get, you want, you have to get rid of everything. And everyone around you disappears. Yeah. Everything around your life is gone. And then you're standing alone on the planet. And, you know, where do you go from there? So, so that's, and there really weren't that many resources. I mean, I, I was Googling online, you know, hit by a beam, you know, mind spirits. Um, you know, wow. you know, seeing triangles. Wow. You know, trying to see if there was anybody out there in the yeah. world that was, would even relate to that. Yeah, um, yeah. I, find, I also, um, a friend of mine was so afraid about taking me um, to any mainstream psychiatry. And so before I got stuck in the mainstream system, um, she suggested, a friend of hers was in a, a mental hospital in Panama and a shaman from Colombia um, worked with her and cleared her and got her out. And she suggested that I go to the jungles of Colombia. Wow. And so I got, I got on a plane by myself, not, not at all connected to this world and decided, you know, I got to do something. So I went um, and spent two weeks with, a, a, I would call it a crackpot group of uh, brujos and brujas. <laughs> <laughs> um, down there. And that was an extraordinary experience too. I mean, it was something else. I've never, wow. I mean, it's in my book. You'll see it in the book. It, wow. it was totally an extraordinary experience. Gosh. And um, 
they cleared me. They, they told me they had two other women that they had worked with. And they said both of them committed suicide. And they told me that they would be, it would be very difficult for them to do it, to work with me. But um, there was just something, you know, there was something, str- a strong piece in my mind that knew I had a greater purpose yeah. in this. And yeah. that's kind of what kept me, kept me going. Because I think if, you know, there were, I also too, I also, um, you know, planned my suicide. I could not take the voices. I could not take the, the swirling of energies that were around me. And I didn't know how, you know, where do you go to stop it? Where do you, you know, where do you flip the switch? Yeah. And uh, so it was a very difficult um, time for me as well. Yeah. Um, through this. But I knew, that, but I guess there was that purpose that I always had going through my mind that said, yeah. you've got to get to the other side of this somehow. Yeah, so yeah. That's, where, that's how I got here. Wow. I mean, gosh, there's, there's just so much vital information in there, Laurie. It's like, and like you said, that one meeting, that one psychiatrist that validated you, that said, you know, you're going through a spiritual experience was your turning point, you said. But I think... I just want to rewind because I think it's so important to mention the fact that, you know, you were very successful entrepreneur, businesswoman, living a very kind of mainstream life. And this happened completely out of the blue for you. Um, And now it's just your normality. You said, you know, your whole life before that kind of disintegrated and it changed your path. And is that the name of that's your name of your memoir, the disintegrated? Disintegration of my ordinary life. Disintegration of my ordinary reality. <laughs> oh, amazing, brilliant. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's so, so important that we acknowledge that, that this can happen to anybody, you know? Um, and I noticed on your, on your little introduction video and your website, which is beautiful, by the way, I'll, I'll share your website on the blog. Um, that you talk about, which is another really common thing I'm finding, is that when you were a, ch- a young child, having spirit communication was very natural for you, but you pushed it away because that wasn't acceptable within our society. Is that, is, do you think that's hugely related? It was, it was a very innate thing for you and you pushed it away and it was the trauma, the trauma of your husband dying that kind of brought that all back up for you. I think it, you know, it, it was very much a part of me. It was very interesting in this, in the, in this story. Um, right before I met my husband, <clears throat> I was probably 25, 26. And a friend of mine called. I was still here in Arizona. I hadn't moved. I hadn't met him when I hadn't moved to Central America. And we went out. She said, oh, let's go talk to this shaman out in the desert. And we're like, okay, fine. You know, it was more like a, you know, <laughs> something to do, whatever. And so we went out there. And she was, he was doing all this stuff. And he looked and his cat jumped up on my lap and it was just all over my energy and licking my hands and everything. He said, you over there. So he pulled me into this other room and he had me put my hands out <clears throat> and he put his hands on my hands and he said, you're a healer. What's the matter with you? You're in the wrong place. You're supposed to be in, in Central America. And I'm like, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, this is great. Yeah. So he gave me these rocks and he says, okay, you're going to be a healer someday. You know, I, and you're going to have your mind be with the mind. You should be with the mind people. So then I meet my husband. I move to Central America. He takes me to this lake that is where I have this connection to all these mind people from previous lifetimes. And then I have this karmic goal that I have to take care of with all of these souls and people and all this. And so, you know, who knows? And then I look back on that moment, and then I look back further when I was a child, who I could see spirits, and I, I my parents would say um, that I, they would go to the dining room table, and no one could sit down because all of my spirit friends were sitting on the chairs, and so they I go no, you're sitting on so and so, no, you're sitting, and my parents would drive them nuts, and they'd just be no, he's that spirit is gone, and they chase them away, so. So that they could sit down. Mm. So, but again, it's that realization when you come to that moment to say, "I always have known this. Yeah. And I've had this. I had this beautiful relationship with the spirit world as a child. I remember. I remember it very vividly. 
And I remember it as, as positive. It was never a negative um, mm. as a child. Wow. Wow. Like, who are in this, you know, I, I work with clients who are going through these things, and a lot of them are impasse, you know, a severe impasse, yeah. and have had these childhood experiences. So yeah. I think there's a line in this somehow that we kind of end, end up in this emergence as, as um, time goes by. Yeah, I think you're so right. And I was just I was just going to say, I think there's more and more children as well, isn't there, being born empaths and sensitive and being diagnosed with X, Y and Z disorder because they're really sensing into things um, and, and our society doesn't understand or accept. So, yeah, bringing knowledge, awareness to the mainstream about this is so, so important, so important. So your yeah. journey, we miss it. And like you say, they get stuck on this path. You know, it's the ADD, ADD and then they're this, yeah. and then it just, the yeah. diagnosis is just keep t- taking them on this path for forever, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, you know, I'm really not a labels kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, you know, all these labels are are you know detri- real big detriment to people. Yeah. Did you did you ever get a label yourself when you were in hospital? Yes, I was um, borderline schizophrenic, psychic break, bipolar. Um, you know, there was there was a nice list of things. The whole and, shebang. Um, I have to tell one funny story though when I was in the middle because the spirits were with me and they were talking to me when I was giving. Oh yeah, it doesn't stop, does it? It doesn't go away. You just. Yeah. <laughs> But it was so funny because I they asked me the, the question. They said, "Do you hear voices?" And um, and I said, "Yes." And then I could hear this voice going, "No, don't tell them that. You're gonna be your toes to tell them that, you know." So then I got real quiet, and then um, I didn't say anything. So then I was, of course, catatonic because I wouldn't speak. Mm-hmm. And so then the doctor came. And he said, um, the one doctor said to the other, she doesn't speak, she only, and she only said that she hears voices. So I could see the word schizophrenic going on the you know, page. And so the doctor said, um, now I see that you're from, um, from El Salvador. Do you speak Spanish? I said, see. Sí. So they told me to say see. Sí. So I said, see. Sí. And so he said, um, when, he goes, when do you hear the voices? And then the spirits told me to tell him when I have my iPod on. <laughs> And so I told him, I told him, I said, when I have my iPod, he goes, is it only when you have the iPod? I said, oh yeah, only when I have the iPod. He goes, okay. And that's when they crossed off schizophrenia. So I was oh. saved from the schizophrenia label. Wow. Wow. So, so Laurie, what did you do to help, help you integrate on your journey? And, and it's, it's, I mean, how long ago are we talking? When did this happen to you? How long has it taken? See, it was seven years ago that I had the, um, the I got hit with this light. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. So what have you used to help on your path to healing, to kind of the recovery? So what did you find as an alternative? No, I'm a voracious reader. So I was trying to, I, I have read every single book about everyone who died and went, came back and, and, you know, I have tried to, I mean, my, my library was just massive. I sat down and literally read a hundred books about it. And then of course the shamanic world and all that. Um, I took, I did some training, not that I needed to learn how to do it because it was in, it just got downloaded into me. Yeah. At least it gave me this kind of template for what I was experiencing and, you know, how shamans work and, and mm-hmm. how this work you know, affects um, them. You know, being a shaman is literally walking the line of insanity. I mean, it's, mm. it's truly walking the world. So yeah. it was helping me understand what other people were seeing, and that it was related to what I was seeing as well. And I think the number one thing that I tell everybody is you need a mentor. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't, you can't do this by yourself. Yeah. Just yeah. no, there's absolutely no way. Yeah. Um, I needed to respect it. I needed someone to say, what I, you know, as soon as I would call you know, one of my mentors and say, I'm seeing this, and then she she go, yeah, okay, it's fine. Because I got some validation that what was happening to me was real. 
Yeah. And and she she's so grace she was so graciously helping me through the process and, and realizing that I didn't have any structure for what was going on with me. So I think a mentor is huge. And and you know, when we look at indigenous cultures, they always had mentors. Mm-hmm. They always mm-hmm. had somebody to say, Okay, awakening they're awakening, bring them over here. They mm-hmm. carry them through the process, they they work with them, they you know, give them the skills. And, you know, we don't have that in our society. We just dump them in mental hospitals. Yeah. So I think a, I think a mentor is, is just imperative. You need mm-hmm. to have somebody. Mm-hmm. And, so, and somebody that's, that's walked it themselves. You know, this is where the peer movement is so important, isn't it? Somebody that's actually been through the process. You can't understand it unless you... Online groups, you know, what you're doing... Um, you know, reaching out, I mean, to be able to go online, if I could have gone online and said, you know, my own spirit's talking to me, lights, and everyone, and had 10 people go, oh, yeah, I had Celtic spirits, and I, you know, oh, my yeah. God, that would have changed the dynamic of all of that, but yeah. there really wasn't anything available at that time. Yeah, yeah. So do you mind giving giving some more examples, Laurie, of the kind of things you experience, like talking about normalizing this for people? There, there'll probably be people watching this who are having all sorts of anomalous experiences. I know you've had quite a lot, quite a category. <laughs> I just wonder if you'd mind sharing a bit more detail about the kind of things that happen well, to I, you. I think what happens is, you know, what I found happened to me was, well, first of all, with this light, it certainly created an energy, it did some kind of energetic chemical, chemistry change in who I was. I was, I felt fried in my, in my um, I almost felt like I'd been hit by lightning. Yeah. So it changed the, the structure of who I was inside. So I found myself almost like a light bulb. And I think we, we, we reach this certain level when we go through spiritual awakening where we are, the light is coming on. Mm. So we're experiencing this light, but what that means is we're like in a we're in a park with a bunch of moths because we're drawing all of these things to us at mm. night, mm. you know, because this big light you know coming on, and then you know every the, of course the dark comes in, and so I think I think that that's probably the, the biggest thing I learned was that. I carried a huge responsibility now for who I had become in this yes. awakening or in, enlightening, as we say. Yeah. Um, and that was a big responsibility. But most of us don't have any, any um, way of protecting ourselves. Mm-hmm. We don't understand these energies can be detrimental to us. Mm-hmm. And so we just, you know, we, we trample through it, not really knowing how to take care of it. We listen to the wrong voices. But that was, that was the one thing that I was really helpful for me with a mentor is that um, she said, said any voice that tells you anything negative is is just off it's got out, out of your, it's got to be out of your you know your field mm-hmm. and so I started I was able to start to manage energy I could, you know the energies had thumbprints for me now so I know when that energy comes into my field I know that that's a good energy for me, but it takes a long time. It's just like friendships are going to a party. Yeah. You know, who are you going to hang out with? You kind of have to feel it out and see who's who. And that's the same thing with the, with the spiritual world. Yeah, that's guess, a really good way to put it. Yeah, and I think that's why I came up with concierge, because I think it's, a, it's like you almost need someone to introduce you to this, these other energies in this other place. Yeah. Um, I, I spent almost two years in and out of the fourth and fifth dimension. And so I, I really had a sense of, of how it worked. I could, I could see the matrix behind everything and I could see how energy worked. And so this helped me, helped me a lot to understand how I was affecting things. Because if you're a light bulb, um, it's really helpful to see your impact that you're having on those subtle energy levels. Mm. And then you can be walking in the world in the proper um, energy that keeps you safe and keeps you sane. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's really important is learning to discern kind of what's, what's for your higher good, isn't it? And your purpose rather than, and what's coming from limiting beliefs or external darker sources or our own ego then that, that still needs to be healed i just um one of the things you just mentioned there was as about kind of the information that you brought back with you from your experience and it's 
I think that's so important, isn't it? It's like there's so many people having awakenings and bringing back, like coming on the hero's journey, you know, coming back with the elixir. And that's why we're here, finding our purpose. Um, and you, that's something you talk about on your website as well as like it's, it's completely shifted your life purpose. So now you are a concierge for people who are walking the path and waking up and maybe falling into psychiatry. Do you mind telling people a bit about what you do now, what that means for you, your spirit concierge? One of the things that I'm really fascinated by actually is soul retrieval. You mentioned soul retrieval because that's common, isn't it? That we kind of get very splintered um, through trauma. So if you could explain a bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm a little, I, I'm sometimes hesitant about soul retrieval just because of past life work. Because I don't want to bring anything into this lifetime that would, create, that would complicate anything. So I'm very, very careful about you know, moving um, on the timelines. And, I, and, and I'm lucky to have this group of spirit guides who work with me and they're very, very careful about keeping that humanness intact in this lifetime and not playing too much of this, um, you know, this timeline game. But there are times when I run into um, situations with clients where there is that piece missing and it's a vital piece. In other words, it's a, it's a very strong, um, missing piece that is impeding this human journey at this time. And I believe that those times it's very, it's vital to do that work. And, um, and I found some, I've had some amazing experiences of, you know, actually going back and pulling that piece, you know, back in. I had a client recently who um, was really struggling with a tough mental illness case. And I'm, um, and he had a fear of, such a tremendous fear of being incarcerated. And so he was constantly in, in, on the edge of being incarcerated all the time. Yeah. And I, I saw him in his past life um, in, uh, unjustly incarcerated in a prison back in, in Europe. And, um, and, there was, and that, that piece of him was still there. And so this fear, he had no way of dealing with, you know, no way of removing this fear. He'd gone to therapist. But it's funny, he said that he used to watch that show, Law and Order. Mm. He said, I was, I was obsessed with it about justice, about being accused and, and going to jail without. Wow. Wow. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I went back and went back into the lifetime, brought that piece back put it back in him and he's, he's been great ever since, but it, you know, it was such a compelling piece that was missing. I think it was, you know, the work in those cases should be done. That's a great example. Cause it's like, it shows why past life experiences are so important, doesn't it? It's like, it, it's, it, we have, we carry memories. Um, we were talking earlier as well about the LGBT community. And I really strongly feel that, you know, people that are having transgender issues and things like that, which is hugely traumatic. It yes. can be memories of being in a different body in a past life. You know, I, um, this what, so I, what I have found in that community is that um, a lot of times, um, if you, a lot of um, people who become gay um, have been women in previous lifetimes but they have been abused or been, they were in a very weak position. And so to come into this lifetime, they wanted to come in as a male because there's a dominant, there's a strength mm -hmm. in the male um, body. Mm -hmm. But truly, have, but they are really feminine. And so you know, they, they came in as women, but came, came in in the body of a man because mm -hmm. of this past life mm -hmm. that they had endured of, of great... Um, you know, um, you know, perhaps there was um, abuse or, or any other kind of turmoil that, that happened. And so we're seeing that in some of these switches, and there's also things going the other way. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's women feeling more masculine because of, this, of the same thing. So it's, it's, it's a lot of past life in the LGBT experience, mm -hmm. and also a lot of awakening. So yeah. it's, it's, it's the two kind of together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Community. 
absolutely yeah it's like it's like where the, where the trauma is 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 there's more awakening it's that it's that kind of double edge the paradox thing isn't it it's like the, the trauma is a blessing and it can help wake us up They're very very difficult to see that when you're in it but oh, as, as you know there's so much family stuff going on and you know I, I i'm i don't align myself with lgbt community but i'm a big ally um and for those people because i have been on the coalition i said we talked a lot about the suicide rates yeah. among the um, LGBT community, and this is something that troubles me a lot. Yeah, and, and I think instead, what happens is families run away instead of running towards. Yeah. And I think this, you know, this is my goal is to get people to run towards these people, embrace them. You know, we have P flag organizations, you know, the family organizations teaching family you know, how to deal with um, with this. So. So I think it's it's a it's a it's a big problem, and suicide is a big issue in that community that troubles me. And it yeah, and and amongst the young as well now as well. You know, so many like you were saying before, young empaths growing up, more teenagers who are sensitive and just can't fit into society and are feeling suicidal. And yeah, it's a huge huge issue. That's quite I suppose bringing us into the work you do now with the so you you are the director for education for the mental health coalition in Arizona and it's just like wow to have uh, we were talking before I started to record about how you managed that kind of foot in both worlds and you were saying that you were you were so normal before you had your experience to kind of let you off the hook is that right? I think maybe my normalness got me on there plus I was willing to help help out so um but uh, you know it's, it's been a great, yeah it was, it was a great it's been a great experience because i i think i have a great a different perspective now because i see both sides um i understand you know the mainstream point of view i see you know i, I see some of their struggles and and you know they're coming to grips with a lot of this as well um and i also see the other side of it and um i think you know Probably the most fundamental problem is the way the insurance companies view treatment. And I think that, uh, you know, probably uh, the next step, you know, for, for Katie and all her, her, her crusades is probably <laughs> some awareness with the insurance um, community because I, I see so many people who need a mentor, who need a, a, a wise sage. You know, and and we don't have a we don't have a system available for that. Um, and I've I even talked to some some mainstream psychiatrists who are very interested in in what I do and what others like me do. But they're they're having a tough time bridging that gap and they're saying, "That's Gloria. I sometimes like to send some of my clients to you, you know, to have them checked out. But I don't know, how do I bridge that wide canyon? Like as wide as the Grand Canyon here in Arizona." You know, how do I bridge that between the two professions? Because it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough call. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that you know, my, my goal is um, to start to bring awareness to what, um, you know, what I do um, and then also understand from their perspective as well so that there can be some kind of way to align these two, um, you know, these two professions, really. I mean, you know, shamans are i don't believe shamans can learn by um, a book mm -hmm. or take a class I'm, I'm a real believer in that i think you have to have the experience you have to you have to experience that shamanic initiation you have to be completely destroyed honestly yeah, yeah. And, then, and then you can step into this and i think it's something you just it's just downloaded it's just inherited i don't I don't see it, you know, the, the people that I worked with in Colombia, you know, they didn't have any books or classes or, or anything. They just got it. And, and, you know, and, they, and when I was with them, I could, because I could see what they were seeing. Um, you know, I, I totally understood that it's so, such an organic, such a natural process. I, I, I found that it was just something that, you know, you really need to kind of, you know, you get your PhD in it by by experiencing situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that's just come to mind actually really interestingly as you were saying that, Laurie, is because I was thinking it's so important to do your your own work, your own healing work as well. So you're kind of the clear channel, you're cl you're clear to be the healer. But that's the same, isn't it, for mainstream, you know, that you're only a good physician if you 
it's like physician heal thyself isn't it it's like you know recognizing your own triggers and how you're working with someone which like you've just said you you get a huge initiation in into that when you go through the process so and what you're saying is, is that is so key is having that um is healing yourself yeah. because i i i even i was surprised in to be um, i've had several psychiatrists as clients right wow. i asked them i said you know why you know why me why did you call me and they said i can't go to my profession I have to be perfect. I have to be invincible. And I can't, I can't be in my profession and, and, and resolve what's going on with me. That's so and sad, isn't it? It's so sad. And that's why, you know, I don't want this to be an anti-psychiatry movement. We're just all humans trying to fumble our way through life. And, you know, we all need, we all need help as well. And it's, if we can, that's beautiful to hear. I mean, that's, that's the way it should be, isn't it? It's like just each world helping each other out and bridging the gap. And but as you were saying earlier, it's about funding. It's like this, these needs to be equally funded. One of my visions for the Emerging Proud launch day is it's happening now in hopefully 10 countries on the 12th of May <laughs> is to create you know initiative real collaborations real cat to catalyze initiatives that are really co collaborative to create kind of community hubs or something where therapists and mainstream workers and you know shamanic healers that anybody can all come and work together it's like that's that's where we need yeah. to be heading we were really excited with the um the our, our um, group we had a um, trauma services healing day here in Sedona. Of course, Sedona is very um, open to some of these new ideas. And um, it was very um, successful. We had all the, a lot of the alternative practitioners just came, offered their services for free. Um, people who didn't have money you know, to pay for a, a therapist were able to sit down and you know, talk about their um, issues. And so I think that... Um, it was a big, it was a big success. In fact, now I want us to do to do another one because, like you say, there isn't the access to people like myself and others because of that, um, you know, the lack of insurance helping out and and, and all that. So it's yeah. it's a, it's a big barrier sometimes for people to get get the help that they really need. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's huge. It's it's always about the finances, isn't it? So I mean, hopefully, awareness raising will will really help to bridge that as well eventually i think the more of these groups i mean what you're doing is totally amazing and you know i'm excited about phil's movie that's coming out you know it's just that is huge awareness in fact i'm hoping to um get that film we also work a lot with films here because we have a festival and so i'm i'm sure phil's movie will be floating around i keep chasing after it, but we'll see where it ends up because i know the festivals are interested in it um yeah. but um yeah so I think that, um, you know, that those kind of things help. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a really great story here. Um, you know, you're part of this amazing story. And I think we all, all of us who have kind of emerged and come out on the other side of this, um, you know, I, the way I educate the community here is we talk, we, we, we share our stories. Yeah. And, and when we get this, we get these great stories and then we make one big, great story. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then it, then it becomes such a transitional moment for everyone because yeah. it's like, oh my God, we're all in this together and we've all Absolutely. been and we come out on the other side and look at you, you and I are talking, you know, who knows what, you know, seven years ago, what would have, how this conversation would have, <laughs> <laughs> it would have been pretty crazy at that time. Absolutely. You know, look at that emergence and look at that transition, look at that shift, look at that, you know, that moving into this, into this um, new story. It's and, uh, and helping us understand our story because yeah. we did, I, I didn't have one i didn't have anybody's story no no it's like and i've got i mean so much respect for you laurie to be openly sharing your story so i mean so much detail about your trauma and i know we haven't gone into a lot of your trauma but you talk about a lasagna of trauma that you've been through i love that phrase it's like and it really is you know it's it's like that's making it lighthearted, but you've been through such a lot um i, I ended up in a very in a country that had a lot of violence and um 
course, you know, I was insulated from it. I, I felt, you know, protected, you know, with my husband and, you know, the, the life that we led there. But, um, you know, I just so many traumatic things that happened and I just kept burying it and like in my lasagna and it just was layers and layers and layers. You know, I had, you know, we had a lot of gang violence where I, where I lived. Um, you know, there was a war going on when I first went there. So I had AK-47s pointed at my head and I had, uh, you know, people were killed in my, outside my garage and a um, lot of death, a lot of destruction. I had a bomb go off in my, um, near my car when I was trying to get in it one night and blew me back in the back seat. And, um, you know, I just had all this, you know, stuff. And I, as I say, my lasagna trauma. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, I, all that added up. And then, you know, that, ha that has to go somewhere. It's, it's yeah. like a, it's, it's got to go. You the know? time bomb, isn't it? Waiting to go off. Yeah. So, you know, my husband died. That was like the last, that was like the mozzarella cheese on <laughs> on the top of the yeah the, yeah 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 pull it wow. out of the oven wow oh. wow and then they saw the phenomenon that happened with it in the place where i was living so yeah. it was a total destruction like i said it in my book you know the book the destruction of an ordinary reality i love that title it's and it's so true it's like you're so you're so right everything's totally got to fall apart for this emergence to happen it's the only way isn't it but so going back to kind of you, what I was saying about you being so open, it's like, I think once you've been faced with death so clearly, it's like, do you find that the, your fear is just completely dissipated and that's why you're so open? Because to do the work that you do, you know, really mainstream professional work, but also be writing your memoir, be very open online about your story is it's rare. It's very rare. It's very brave. That's why I'm, I, I've got so much respect for you doing that and being here because it's people like you that are going to really help this movement shift forwards. Because if I know, I know people who have experiences who, who, you know, and it's scary, but won't speak out because they're in a professional role or whatever it might be. But the shift won't happen unless people like you do that. So I, I'm so grateful. So, so grateful. Oh, thank you, Katie. Yeah, it's, um, you know, like, it's so true what you say about the fear, because I think the shamanic journey is the limit, is the total destruction of fear. Um, when I came out of this, I had I have absolutely no fear of anything. Um, you know, maybe a tiger. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Even I'm probably over that too. But um, <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, you know that, and that's that is the shamanic journey. That is the shamanic initiation. It is the total destruction of fear. Because I found whenever I was fearful of something, I was bringing it to me. You know, I was this pole of light and everything was coming towards me. So whatever I was fearful of was arriving. Yeah. So it was going in and finding out, okay, let's dissect this. You know, what, in what layer is this? And by, by eliminating that, and you finally just give up. You know, I, I, I think it's surrender. I think it's just saying, I don't, you know, whatever. Whatever happens to me is going to happen. I'm going to surrender to the process. I'm going to trust the universe. And I'm going to walk through the world knowing that I'm fine. And, and then when all that drops, then that little peaceful energy starts piling in. And it fills in those gaps that are so broken open and all that fracturing. So I think that, yes, fear, for me, fear is a biggie. And it was a big part of my process, getting to where I was. And it's really, you know, I, I tell a lot of my clients, I say, look, I know I'm going I'm to hear your story. and I'm going to hear what happened. But I'm gonna if I put almost every story that I hear in a pot and I boil it on my stove, I'm gonna find a bunch of fear in the bottom. Mm. Because that's kind of what's what's it's always kind of what's left in there. And until that's dealt with, it's really hard for us to move through through life. Mm. We're afraid of afraid of ourselves even. Mm. Yeah. And like you say, it's hard to even get out and talk about it. You know, I I had a conversation with a very important spiritual person. And when I read my books, now that my book's coming out, I said to her, I said, I see all these very enlightened people and they're all speakers and they're all out there. 
but they're all telling me what they learned. I said, there aren't any books about what they went through. Mm. Have you noticed that? And I thought, you know, I want to hear what, I want to hear what got them to that. Yes, yes. It's like, it's like we, always, we always just talked about, oh, now I had this awakening in my mind, <laughs> what it was about, yeah. it, you know, kind of, it's crazy. But then here I am, this great guru, I got, um, I, I got this experience, but well, I wanted to know, you know, what about this piece? They talk how, how did, it. Yeah. I mean, to talk about that. They want to talk about how wonderful yeah. you are. They are. You'll and see. I remember my one time, he, I, I gave him my first four chapters, and he threw it back at me, he goes, send it back when you tell me the truth. <laughs> and I thought, I am, I'm skirting around it. I'm trying right. to, yeah. I can massage this so it doesn't yeah. look so crazy. I yeah. People don't judge me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I better see how I do So I said, you know what? I'm going to write the truth. And I just said, and it's interesting because the three editors that have worked with me have said, Lori, we love it. It's, it's, it's raw. It's, yes. it's juicy. It's, Take a bite. <laughs> but that's what people need, isn't it? You're so right. And it's story sharing is so so vital for people who need hope who are in the darkness who are in the crisis i was talking to leah harris um a couple of weeks ago and she's writing a, a book around telling your story how to tell your story and why that helps people and why it's necessary and it's like you were saying before it's about the peer thing it's if, if people know where you've been and how dark it's been and that you've been suicidal and you know then it it gives them hope it doesn't give people hope when they're seeing this like you say this guru who's saying i've got it all sorted it's like that's not the bit that helps I want to get behind the scenes <laughs> that's what i love about your website though it is really raw and real and you know you say it as it is and yeah it's it's good well, you know I, I guess i guess probably being on the coalition has helped a lot with that because one of the things that has been most compelling in the community is telling people telling their stories and and i remember last year we did a we have a, a bridge here in sedona that's um a lot of people jump off of and it's um something we worked very hard to you know to try to resolve um but um i had we had a, a panel we had all of the, the families of people whose children had jumped off the bridge and then we had the first responders oh. and we brought everybody together and it was such a, a compelling moment because they never saw the you know the, the family side of it they didn't hear the story you know, the first responder doesn't know the life of that of that mm body that's at the bottom of the bridge mm. and it was, it's interesting how the, the bridge bridged these these people mm. together and mm. they could see they could see so much more of, the, of what happened and and they could thank each other for for you know getting through the process and all that it was such a compelling story and i and i realized at that time you know it's really not about a fancy speech or about a you know a, a shiny PowerPoint presentation. It's just, it's just that gut raw um, experience that we share with others, and someone, and it just, you know, turns a switch on in somebody and says, "Oh my God, that's exactly what I needed to hear today, just to get me through that next 24 hours." Yes. And um, so I think the power of a story is, and, and there aren't a lot of memoirs on the market, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, of spiritual awakening. There's, there's more of the scientific views and. And there's a lot of that. I know there's, a, you know, there's some great authors that have done that and they've been very successful. But I think more and more um, we should have, you know, authors, I, I would encourage authors to get out there and, and tell their stories and, and get them out there because I think every book that we can write about this um, you know, will be well received and it's going to touch somebody's life somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the positive domino effect, isn't it? It's like the more, the more people that do that and speak out, the more normalized it becomes. So... Yeah, so your book, when is your book due out? <laughs> no, I, I had no idea. <laughs> quite, quite this process. I know you have written one. In fact, I have your book right here, Katie. Oh. <laughs> yeah, one of your purchasers of your book. <laughs> wow, that's so exciting to think it's in Arizona. Yeah, I'm excited to hold your book in your hand. Oh my gosh, oh. that's so But yes, I've been, I've been at the book for about five years, um, on and off. I've thrown oh. it away hold it back and you know you're that especially I think when it's a memoir it's um a little more personal and so you've got a lot more massaging to do yep um, 
I found an amazing editor. I'll give her a plug. Stephanie Gunning. She's she's an amazing human being. She's in New York, and um, she just massaged it and you know, molded it into this gorgeous, beautiful thing. And I have a great agent um, who's um, doing the book uh, production. And he's getting it on the on the page, and he's he's very creative. In fact, um, he's written several books himself. Um, he rewrote the book of book of um, the birthdays. It's a very famous book. Um, and so I have this little team back there, and I call them my little minions. They're, they're all working to get it all put, put on paper and in the right style and all that. Um, so um, they're supposed to have everything to me probably by the middle of May. And um, then um, I, I think I mentioned to you before we got on that I'm going to be a speaker at the LGBT um, um, conference that we're doing on Health Talks Online, which I think is, is amazing to address the needs of that community. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, she's um, <clears throat> lesbian, and she, you know, she says, "Why why not you get involved?" I'm like, you know, but I'm not in that community. And she's like, "Yes, but you care about us." I said, "Okay, Aww. yeah." And I do because of like the reasons I mentioned before, but um, so I'm, we're gonna have that kind of going on at the same time. So it's um, it's exciting, you know, to, but it's also you know, like um, we've been talking, you know, it's getting over that big fear. You know, putting your life out there, you know, putting a life that's, that many people who know me would never believe was possible that yeah. I would have that experience. Yeah. So it's jumping over a few hurdles, but, uh, but the story's, story's important yes. and the story is helpful. And so, um, and I think there's something also um, kind of therapeutic about writing the memoir. I highly suggest it for therapy as well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I can so relate to that. And like you said before, it's like you've got to kind of, it takes a while because you've got to get to a place in yourself where you're ready to expose your, your darkness to the world. Yeah. And, you know, your darkness and your, and your journey to light. Yeah. Because, you know, really there is, <laughs> this is what is so important for me is that, is that, I want people who are, who, are, who are watching today and who are really struggling with whatever is going on, that there is a light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah. Um, the process is so important and you can't speed it up and you can't slow it down. It just has to happen in its own organic way. And so I, I, I ask everyone to embrace it in some way, whatever way you can find to embrace this. Uh, because truly you can come out of this and, and you will live an amazing life and this is over because the walking the world after going through this initiation and going through this you know, topsy-turvy turmoil, um, it's a different world that you walk. You see things, and I know you probably do about, you know, as we were talking about going out in nature, I mean, a, a bird looks so different than it ever looked. A stream is so much more vibrant yeah. Um, you know, everything in the world is so much greater when all that darkness goes away. And you get that, that's, your, that's the prize, that's the gift mm. at the end of this. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful message to leave people with. Thank you so much, Laurie. Just could talk to you for hours about what you do, but um, we'll share your, so lauriemorrison.com is your website where people can find yes, out all about it. Send me notes. Tell me, you know, what, what's going on. I like to, I try to respond to everybody that's on there. And you'll probably um, have a barrage of people wanting to work with you now. Trying to keep I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll say something back. And and I have a lot of articles on there too. Um, a lot of the things that the spirits have used, you know, you know lessons that they've um, taught my clients, as I've seen them personally. So they might help somebody too. So just jump on there in the blogs. Be happy to leave a note. Yeah, beautiful blog, beautiful blog. And um, i just seen the one about the, the, uh, the not tango. What's it? Oh, gosh, what's the, what was the, you're talking about writing your book referred to a dance. Oh, yes, yes, yes. 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 I, isn't that amazing? Yeah, <laughs> That's so yeah. funny. Yeah, I, you're, I can't, re can't wait to read your book because your writing is really, really great. So. <laughs> yeah, I compared my um, writing my, me my memoir to um, taking a tango lesson. Yes. <laughs> With yeah. Richard here, of course. <laughs> <laughs> really great, really great. Yeah. I think it ended there somehow. <laughs> uh, oh, it's yeah. so, lovely to, so lovely to talk to you, Laurie. I really, really appreciate you being here and sharing and just saying, just it's incredible that the, the amazing amazing people i've met doing this campaign and 
you know your your story is just unbelievable and if people can see a bit more of your story and your in your longer video on your website as well it's wow it's incredible so and you know katie i just i just want to thank you too and um, um, um katie has agreed to be our speaker here at the mental health coalition um <laughs> we're gonna have her on the videos and i'll i'll figure out all that but um but we're really excited for katie to speak at, um, to our group and um really take on this topic that sometimes is kind of hidden um you know from some view and um, I, i'm so blessed you know to have you in our in our spiritual awakening world and with all that you're doing and everyone go support katie yeah. um, <laughs> and we look forward to having you at our meeting and sharing your experiences and all the good things that you're doing Thank you, Laurie. I yeah, really so appreciate that, that invite. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's kind of been my dream right from the start, really, to, to bridge, mend the gap between, yeah. between this world and psychiatry. So, yes, really, really excited to do that. Well, this is the place of the Grand Canyon. So that's where we, <laughs> we have wide canyons. And we yeah. Like canyon, you said, so. everything starts in Sedona, doesn't it? The Celestine Prophecy was one of the books that helped me actually talking about reading. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the, a lot of this, a lot of people who who emerge and onto this into this world, um, start by Sedona on their way. So we're glad you're coming by. Yeah. Oh, I'd hope to hope to be there in person one day too. <laughs> oh yes, gotta come, gotta come in person too. <laughs> to know Sedona without being here because it is an energetic place. Mm -hmm. um, it requires you know to to be in it, but um. But I, I pinch myself every day. I mean, am I really here in Sudan? Of course, I've been in so many dimensions. I do have to pinch myself a lot. <laughs> Ground yourself I, in Sedona. Oh, here, yes, I'm in Sedona. That's a good thing. Wow. You know, this is this, this um this um it's actually a photograph behind me. Is the top of a shaman's hat? Oh wow! In, in Africa, in Cam in I think Cameroon, Africa. Wow! And, and isn't that? I'll move oh, my head, so. I thought it was a flat, a real close up of a flower. Yeah, beautiful. Top of this hat. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yes. That yes. reminds me of your. You you were talking about the um, hyacinth um, feather, weren't you? For your your was your original book name? And is that the yes. Mayan, Mayan headwear? Yes, that was that was part of the Mayan um, connection too. You know, I, in the book, I found out a lot about past lives. I found out a lot about um, you know, my connection to that world at the time. And um, I won't give away the whole story, but, um, but there's a lot of that woven through it. And one of the, one of the pieces that kind of weaves its way through is that there's a hyacinth in the of it. So there is some, that, that, that you'll, you'll read about that when you see the book. But, um, wow, God. We, we, changed, we changed the title. So we're moving forward with it with the new title, and we'll keep, we'll keep the hyacinth feather as a secret inside the book now. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I think your book probably needs to go on the education for all of the clinicians that you're working with as well. <laughs> yeah, it, quite, it would be quite a case study. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Very important. Yeah, very challenging, oh. I'm sure. But I have to say, I had some wonderful people who helped me along the way. And I think that I'm sure you have too in your, oh, you know, your journey. Absolutely. But, you know, the key are the ones who step forward at the times when it was most difficult to step forward. Yeah. And um, so I'm always grateful to them. Yeah, like you say, mentors are just vital on this journey. We can't do it alone. So that's why it's so beautiful to connect with others and like yeah. yourself. So, yeah, thanks so much, Laurie. Look forward to talking to you again. Hey, Katie, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be a part of your group, and I look forward to all the exciting things that you're doing. And then we'll continue to connect, and let, please let me know how I can support you. Bless you. you. Thanks so much. Check out Laurie's uh, website, everyone. <laughs> thanks, Katie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Virtual hug. Yeah.